developing this this morning. Jeffrey Rosen, get to know this name, the acting attorney general during the final months of the Trump administration. He testified over the weekend about Trump's efforts to try and overturn the election. We also learned his former deputy talked to a Senate committee about it on Friday before Rosen gave his, wait for it, seven hours of testimony himself on Saturday. Joining me now to discuss the reporter who broke this story. I'm so glad she's here. New York Times Justice Department reporter Katie Benner. Also with us, former federal prosecutor Glenn Kirshner. Katie, first of all, we don't know what Rosen said, but the fact that it was seven hours, that's a lot. I want to I want you to explain another name to us, though. Investigators are focused on a former DOJ official named Jeffrey Clark. Who is he? What did he do? Sure. Jeffrey Clark was the, the real focus of the conversation that Rosen had with investigators. Jeffrey Clark, he worked at the Justice Department. He was a top official. He ran the civil division, which is the division that litigates the government's positions in court. He also ran the Environmental National Resources Division. He was really low key. Very few people outside of the department ever knew who he was. But what emerged in December is that Jeffrey Clark was an official inside the department who believed that President Trump may have won. He thought truly that there could have been fraud that impacted the election. And he thought this despite the fact that former Attorney General Bill Barr said that that was not the case, the fact that Jeffrey Rosen said that that was not the case, and that top officials at the department believed the election was correct, the election was valid, because they had actually done their own investigative work looking into allegations of fraud that President, former President Trump had made and had asked them to look into. So Clark was the rare figure who thought that there was a way for Trump to win the election. And unbeknownst to his colleagues, he was secretly in communications directly with President Trump, which is a big no-no, saying to him, we can find a way to help you win. I want to know how close they were to finding that way, because obviously we all saw what happened on January 6th. But help us understand this timeline of what they were doing. How close were they to any sort of breakthrough here? I mean, it's crazy. I think that people inside the department, including former officials like Jeff Rosen, would say that legally they were nowhere near close to overturning the election because the election was valid, the results were valid, and there was not any legal way to overturn it. But what they were close to doing, they were close to putting out, for example, letters to officials in Georgia and perhaps even other states that would be an official indicator that something was wrong. Even if that was false, even if that was not true, what it would do is it would further poison the minds of the electorate, further cause people to believe, voters to believe, that the election was marred by fraud. And by inserting that bigger than a seed of doubt, and by inserting that official voice saying that something bad had happened, it would go a long way toward, again, undermining faith in democracy. And that is what they were close to doing. Glenn, I'd like to believe that poisoning the minds of the electorate is criminal, but maybe it's not. What kind of consequences could he face? Great question, Steph. So let's plug Katie's great reporting into a legal framework. And with apologies, Steph, I'm going to enlist you in a hypothetical crime. I think I've done this to you before on air. So what we have here is the president asking his DOJ officials to lie. Say the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me. We now know that Jeffrey Clark, a DOJ official, took him up on that. And what he did was he authored a letter to Georgia state officials and the state officials of five other states trying to implement Donald Trump's lie and undermine the election results. What that is, Steph, the minute I saw that reporting about what Jeff Clark did, I thought now we have not only a conspiracy, an agreement between two people to commit a crime, defraud the United States, undermine the election results. We have the second element of conspiracy, which is an overt act. So, Steph, if you and I agreed to rob a bank and I went out and got the gun, you went out and rented the car because we were going to use a rental car in the bank robbery. And then the next day we abandoned our plans. We thought, you know what? We're not going to do it. Guess what? Even though we didn't rob the bank, we didn't actually um, uh, move on to the object of the conspiracy. You and I hypothetically committed the crime of conspiracy to rob a bank. That is what these facts support and demand an investigation of a conspiracy that um, was was uh, involved President Trump and involved Jeff Clark and perhaps others. 
Katie, for four years, we saw, you know, Don McGahn, John Bolton and others drag their feet, drag their feet when it came to testifying. What should we take around Rosen moving so quickly to testify? He did it so fast. It's like Trump's team couldn't even block him. What does that tell you? And how nervous should Trump's team be that he did testify for seven hours? Well, I think that it's true that Rosen moved very quickly. Now, people have pointed out that it's been seven months since he left government. But what was going on in the background is he was negotiating with the Justice Department under the Biden administration to say, what can I tell investigators? Because in general, former officials like Jeff Rosen are just not allowed to talk about conversations they had with the president. They're not allowed to talk about executive branch discussions. Those things are covered by privilege. So Rosen did need to get an okay from the Justice Department. He needed officials to say, hey, listen, we are not going to invoke executive privilege and you do what you will with that freedom. He immediately reached out personally to the inspector general of the Justice Department, Michael Horowitz, and he said, what do you need from me? I want to give it to you. And he went in as quickly as he could to speak with Horowitz. And then, yes, he did speak to the Senate Judiciary Committee for almost seven hours. Now, that says to me that he feels that he has a story to tell, that he feels that something happened that was not right, and that he does have some fear that the Trump team would have moved to block his testimony, because what he's provided to investigators is a roadmap and several more threads upon which they can pull. He's giving them information they can build on as they try to better understand what happened. And he is, because he was the acting attorney general, because he was in the room for all these conversations, because the president was reaching out to him directly, he would be a key witness, if not one of the most important witnesses. I can't say how nervous the Trump team should be. I will say that these things always move slowly and that everybody needs to manage their expectations around what can happen next. Investigators will continue to conduct interviews, gather documents, it could take months and months. Just remember how long it takes for an inspector general investigation to complete. That's more than a year.